shoots of recovery, even in a world scorched by nuclear fire. When rumors of a mythical seed vault reached her ears, said to contain seeds of every pre-war plant species, a treasure trove capable of revitalizing the barren earth, her resolve hardened. She knew that finding this vault could mean salvation for all. With a motley crew of hardy survivors, Elara set out on a mission filled with hope. The group included a former botanist, Thomas, who spoke with a gentle passion about the power of seeds to restore life, and a grizzled ex-military scout, Jakob, whose knowledge of survival was unmatched. Each member carried the burden of a dead world on their shoulders, but also a flicker of hope. Their journey led them through landscapes that bore the scars of apocalypse, crumbled cities overtaken by wild, mutated vegetation, rivers tainted with chemical hues, and skies that seldom cleared the sickly colors of dawn. Yet, it was the human threats that proved most harrowing. Bands of raiders and rogue militias roamed the wastes, remnants of civilization turned savage. The trail finally brought them to the edge of a region dominated by the Radiant Brethren, a cult that had emerged from the fallout, worshipping the nuclear devastation as divine purification. The cult was known to be both hostile and xenophobic, viewing outsiders as contaminants to their sacred rites. Ilara and her team disguised themselves as pilgrims seeking initiation, blending into the daily life of the cult to avoid detection. They participated in bizarre rituals and listened to sermons about the sanctity of radiation, which the cult believed was a path to enlightenment. During one such ritual, they were led blindfolded through a series of underground chambers, their senses assaulted by the sounds of chanting and the acrid smell of incense. The deeper they went, the more unsettling their surroundings became. The walls of the chambers were adorned with murals depicting apocalyptic visions and humanoid figures glowing with an eerie, unnatural light. It was in these depths that they learned of the cult's ultimate sacrament, the consumption of a holy elixir derived from the seeds, believed to bestow visions of new worlds awaiting the faithful. Alara's chance came when she and Thomas were assigned to garden duty, tending to the bizarre flora that thrived under the cult's care. Here, hidden beneath a decrepit greenhouse dome, they discovered the entrance to the seed vault. Guarded by zealots and secured with old world technology, the vault was more fortress than storeroom. Their plan was desperate and dangerous. On the eve of a high holy day, while the cult gathered for a grand ceremony, Elara and her team orchestrated a diversion. Jakob and two others sabotaged the cult's power supply, plunging the compound into chaos. In the darkness, screams and prayers mingled as the survivors made their move. Breaking into the vault was nothing like they had imagined. Inside, it was an Aladdin's cave of biodiversity. Racks upon racks of meticulously labeled seed packets, preserved against time itself. But as they began to gather what they needed, cult members Enraged and panicked by the blackout, stumbled upon them. A violent confrontation ensued. Thomas was severely wounded, and Jakob held off attackers as Alara and the rest hastily filled their bags with the precious seeds. With every moment, their escape route shrank as more cultists flooded towards the commotion. Their escape through the mutated forests surrounding the compound was a blur of adrenaline and fear. They could hear the cultists' cries long into the night, a haunting reminder of the human madness they had left behind. When they finally stopped, safe but shaken, under the gray expanse of a dawn that brought no warmth, they realized the gravity of what they had undertaken. 
They had not only stolen a potential future from a fortress of fanaticism, but had also ignited a war with zealots who saw them as thieves of the sacred. As they made their way back to their own dwindling community, with the seeds that could one day green the wastes again, they were pursued not just by the radiant brethren, but by the weight of their actions. Each step towards home was haunted by the fear of retribution and the hope of redemption. They had retrieved more than seeds. They had sown the first lines of a new legend, one written in bravery, blood, and the promise of rebirth. Since the fallout, nothing has ever been the same. I never thought I'd be the one to tell a story like this or have survived that day. I am just an average guy from Vault Haven 17, a fallout shelter built for what they called the worst case scenario. And hell, they weren't wrong. Our vault was in the middle of Nevada. We were just kids when the fallout began, raised on stories about the bad outside, never seeing the sun or feeling real wind. Our world was concrete walls and recycled air. Every night, the old intercom would crackle to life with tales of the horrors that awaited beyond the vault, tales meant to scare us from ever trying to leave. So, it was a regular day, or as regular as you can get living underground, when the vent fans started rattling worse than old bones. The techs tried everything but said without new parts, we'd suffocate in weeks. Guess who volunteered to fetch those parts? Yeah me and my four friends, or the disposable teens, as some would joke. We were the reckless ones, the ones who dare each other to get closest to the sealed vault door, the ones who always wondered what lay beyond. Stepping outside for the first time was unreal. The sky was this endless gray sheet, like dirty dishwater, and the ground was littered with debris and skeletons of buildings. Every step felt like walking through a graveyard of the world that once was. We headed toward a nearby town, using old maps that might as well have been treasure maps for all we knew. The silence was the first thing that hit us. No birds, no wind, just the hollow echo of our footsteps. We found the town, or what was left of it. Buildings were just shells, windows like staring eye sockets. We searched for parts in what looked like an old hardware store. It was there we found the first body, not a skeleton like we'd seen, but a mummified corpse, clutching a bag like it was some precious treasure. It was a stark reminder that the world outside was not just dead, it was deadly. After a day of scavenging, we were pretty beat, thinking we might actually pull this off. That's when we met them. Survivors, or so they said. They called themselves the Free Folks, said they could help us with the parts. Desperate and dumb, we followed them to their camp. They didn't fit in. Something was off-putting about them. The smell is something I will never forget. Seeing as we could use the help and had never met outsiders, we set up camp together. The camp was shabby, tents stitched together with scraps and people as thin as shadows. They fed us something that I truly, to this day, think was cooked human flesh. They told us stories of their survival. It was the first time we'd talked to anyone from outside. It felt good, too good. That night, we slept by their fire, thinking we'd hit the jackpot. Come morning, I woke up to screams. Our hosts weren't hosts, but raiders, and they decided we were easier to rob than help. They tied us up, laughing as they picked through our stuff, calling us vault bunnies. Mike grabbed my friend Jenna by her hair, pointing a weapon to her head and telling us that they would do it if we didn't tell them the location to our vault. She didn't make it when she tried to fight back, and right there they ended her, me now furious with rage, beginning to understand that they were never going to let us go. The rest of us were just too shocked to react. I watched in horror as they dragged her away, her screams cutting through the cold morning air. I plugged my ears as I couldn't take it anymore. I threw sand at the man who was just behind me. I managed to get loose. I don't know how, but I did. I ran ran like the devil himself was on my heels. I could hear them chasing me, bullets whizzing by, shouts echoing in the dead air. 
I didn't stop until I saw the familiar rusted door of Haven 17. I didn't even know if I was going to be able to signal them to open up the vault. Fearing they would invade and find a way into my vault, I ran another way and hid, just in case they were watching and waiting for the door to peel open. I fell asleep under a rusted car. Then I began to run again towards the door, whisking by the motion sensors we had set up. Barely made it back, lungs burning, legs shaking. I told the others, warned them about the raiders. They sealed the door for good, said it was too dangerous to try again. But I can't forget, I'm the last one left who's seen the outside, and sometimes I hear Jenna's voice in my dreams, asking why I didn't save her, why I didn't do something, anything. And now, trapped in this steel coffin, the air grows thinner each day, and the lights flicker more frequently. In the suffocating depths of Site 21, a forgotten fallout shelter reborn in crisis, we lived not under the light of the sun, but the dim glow of emergency lamps that never quite chased away the dark corners of our underground haven. Once designed as a sanctuary, it morphed into a cage, locking away the last remnants of a town swallowed by nuclear fire. Life in the shelter was a grim routine. We counted cans instead of days, measured hope in mouthfuls, the initial relief of survival gave way to the claustrophobic reality of eternal confinement. Yet, nothing prepared us for the horror that began with a single, desperate knock from the other side of the sealed entrance. Our gateway to the obliterated world above. The man who stumbled in was a living contradiction to our rules of no entry. Covered in grime and blood, he wore a ragged uniform with the insignia of Haven 23, a sister shelter rumored to be located within a half day's trek through the radioactive wasteland. His arrival split the community. Some saw him as a harbinger of new alliances, others as a bearer of unknown contagions or worse, a spy sent by marauders. He spoke of catastrophic structural failures in Haven 23, of ceilings that caved in, and walls that buckled, unleashing the toxic world outside upon the shelter's inhabitants. His tales were filled with desperate escapes and losses so profound that listening felt like drowning. His survival was nothing short of miraculous, or so it seemed. As days merged into nights, his presence became a catalyst for change. Paranoia crept through the cramped halls of Site 21 like a disease. Supplies started to diminish at an alarming rate, not through mismanagement, but through theft. Valuables and vital equipment disappeared, hoarded or hidden away by those bracing for the worst. Then, one night, the shelter's fragile peace shattered. Screams echoed through the steel corridors, a chilling sound that seemed to come from the very bowels of the earth. We found one of our own, a young woman named Clara, lifeless in the storeroom. Her body was a map of unspeakable atrocities, her death a brutal testament to the evil that had breached our sanctuary. The intruder from Haven, 23 was nowhere to be found. A frantic search revealed a hidden breach in one of the secondary escape tunnels, a passage we had long sealed and forgotten. He had used it to enter and, it seemed, to invite others of his ilk from the poisoned surface. Chaos ensued. Accusations flew like shrapnel, wounding friendships and kinships alike. Trust, once the glue binding our community, now lay as broken as Clara's body. The elders decided that to save ourselves from internal collapse, a party would venture outside to seek help or find another sanctuary like the mythical Haven 33 spoken of in whispers as a place of ample resources and fortified defenses. Volunteers were few. The fear of the unknown, a formidable barrier. Yet, necessity can turn the meekest into warriors. Armed with little more than makeshift weapons and tattered hope, 
we opened the vault door for the first time since the world had ended. The outside air tasted like metal, and the sky was a tapestry of relentless gray. The journey was a descent into further madness. The landscape was unrecognizable, littered with the carcasses of buildings and vehicles. Nature, twisted by radiation, had reclaimed the land with vicious thorns and mutated fauna. Every shadow promised death, every sound a potential ambush. As we navigated this new hell, the realization dawned that there was no Haven 33. It was a myth, a cruel joke perpetrated by those too afraid to confront the reality of our situation. We were alone, surrounded by the remnants of civilization that now seemed as alien as the surface of another planet. Our return to Site-21 was marked not by relief, but by a grim determination. We sealed the door behind us once more, this time welding it shut. The intruder had taught us a brutal lesson. The true horror wasn't the nuclear apocalypse that had ravaged the world, but what it had made of us, the survivors. We turned inward, focusing on fortifying our internal defenses, repairing the breaches not just in our walls, but within ourselves. Yet, even as we strove to rebuild what semblance of community we could, the shadow of the intruder loomed large. Clara's unsolved murder was a nightly specter in our dreams, a constant reminder of the darkness that didn't just dwell outside but within the very hearts of those who had survived. And in those darkest moments, we understood the true terror of our new world. It was not the absence of light, but the absence of trust, the erosion of humanity piece by piece in the face of relentless fear.